Good morning, Liz. Myself here. Good morning. Good morning. I was muted. You were what? <laughs> I was muted when I, I, you said good morning and I said good morning back to you and I realized that I was muted. Oh, I see. Yes, that's right. All right. David and I are walking to the kitchen to get cherries. He wants Ooh, some cherries. I have some cherries. Would you like some? <laughs> yeah, if you could send them over, it would be great. I'll ju just, you know, do one of those portal things, open it on the computer and put them right through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just got one. Right. Okay. We're, we're <laughs> moving. Enjoy. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> last I, night was, uh, I think I was kind of pushy. <laughs> that's okay. And he was a little bit uh, wacky last night. Was he? Was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you have to know, he mentioned that poem that I had never heard of. The poem? Wait, uh, remind me. Was that before uh, I came? Octamus? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Octam Mood. We used to hear that when, uh, a long, long time ago, we used to go to an all-night Shavuos, and in the ah. morning... They they would say the Akdag move. So, yeah. So, yes. So this crazy. morning, I asked Moishi where I could find it. Yeah, it's in the it's, it's in the sitter. It's in the sitter. It's in the art scroll sitter. Yeah. So I found it and I read it. <laughs> I had Did never you heard it. any of it. I it's it's kind uh, of you crazy. know a little bit after listening to him. I kind of uh -huh. got the idea of what they were trying to say, but it looked to me like a recap of Bereshi. Right. Yeah. Something. Yeah, something like that. And days to come. I'm opening the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this um guy, his name is Shmuel. No, Shlomo something. I don't know. He has he actually runs an orthodox um yeshiva but it's it's um the guys go to the army okay they're not they're not they they, they all go to the army oh they used to be they were originally stationed in the sinai and then they moved and anyway they're military but they're orthodox anyway he's in chicago and he always raises money and usually i i avoid it but this time because of what's going on in Israel, I'm going to see him, you know, make uh, ah, a donation. So where? where? Um, well, he's going to call on Monday and either we'll have him come here or maybe I'll meet him at Emma's or I don't know. All right. I'll see. I'll, I'll let you know. He's, um, I got it. I have to go back and find his literature. I forgot what it's called, but and, what? I mean, it sounds like a very good place. Yeah. He had two of his yeshiva boys uh, killed in the war so Hi. far. I Hi. know. Morning, yeah. Rabbi. Hi. What are we talking about? Um, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't remember the name of of his yeshiva. It's a it's a military military yeshiva. They were originally. I'm sorry. I'll I'll find it. I'll let you know. <laughs> they were. I think they were originally in the Sinai, you know, ages ago, and then they moved to. to where? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we're getting, hi Estelle. Hi everyone. Hi, good to hear your voice. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're at mitzvah, two, positive mitzvah 226. That is that he commanded us to kill with a sword those that transgress certain commandments 
And that is his, may he be blessed, saying he must surely be avenged. And behold, in the negative commandments, we shall indicate those which require chopping off the head. And the regulations of this commandment have already been explained in Tractate Sanhedrin. So again, there is, there's no example of this being done to somebody who transgresses a positive commandment. <clears throat> there are only examples of people who, um, who get this punishment, sorry, get this punishment uh, for, for transgressing certain negative commandments. Um, and um, it, it's called death by sword. But as the Rambam uh, makes it clear, we're talking about cutting, cutting their head off. You're not, it, it's not just running them through with a sword, but, um, but cutting their head off. This, um, like the other death penalties that are administered by the court, have to be administered by a court capable of um, making these kind of judgments, um, which is minimally a court of 23. Uh, it doesn't necessarily require the entire Sanhedrin, although a lot of times um, it seems like the, uh, the um, the entire Sanhedrin is involved in, when they give examples of this. I mean, technically, it could be a court of, of 23 um, <clears throat> that uh, gives the death penalty. And um, yeah, so this is one of the death penalties, which is cutting off the head. Um, the only... Um, examples that I've ever seen um, in media. I mean, I, I don't watch any of those people who the, you know, like whenever they had those Taliban things, um, I didn't, uh, I never watched those, I refused to watch them, but I did watch in the Wolf Hall, in that series, Wolf Hall, um, when they uh, kill uh, Anne of Boleyn. Um, so um, that's how, that was in the 1500s. Um, and they, you know, they have an executioner behind the person. Um, in that case, she was on her knees with her um, and she was, otherwise straight she was told that if she doesn't move that um, she won't feel it she won't know what happened to her and um, so everybody's watching it and uh, she doesn't wear a, a hood so she can see the reaction of the crowd because the guy who's the executioner is behind her. He's, he's in stocking feet, so he doesn't make noise. And it seems like his goal is to catch her unprepared so that she doesn't suffer when he does it to her. Um, and uh, that's the assumption. I mean, eventually the French came up with the guillotine and uh, I remember there were discussions about how quickly the brain shuts off after the head is severed. Is it possible there's still conscious thought um, after the head is severed? And for how long would conscious thought remain? Um, and uh, again, it's not a subject of serious interest for me. I don't know very much about it. Um, but my assumption is that it would be done in a way where the person is not experiencing um, the pain of it, 
but I don't know. The, the one where you find most discussion about how they did it in rabbinic times, uh, which, which would have been during the second Beit HaMikdash, um, when they talk about it, the, the one they speak of most is stoning and that they had a method for um, stoning, which is different than how it continues to be practiced in those places that do it. Instead of just having a mob throwing stones at the person, um, they, they um, had this kind of precipice. The person would stand on the precipice. They were drugged beforehand and then they were pushed off. And the goal was that their neck would break when they hit the ground. Um, and again, there seems to be emphasis that the person would suffer as little as possible. There is a discussion of burning. Um, in the Gemara, there's even a figure who interpreted burning like we saw burning, like uh, like you see burning depicted from the Middle Ages, where they would surround the person or have the person stand on wood and they would surround the person with wood and then the person would die, um, you know, the horrible death of being burnt to death. Uh, but again, in the Talmud, when they talk about the burning, they... Uh, which is called Srefa, they talk about it as um, as there's this boiling hot lead that's poured down their throat. I don't know how they would do that in a way that would have no pain. Um, so I don't know about that one. And also there is one that is called chenek, which is strangulation. I think most people, I, I, I don't remember if that is, is, is characterized as hanging or not. Maybe we'll, I'm sure we'll see that brought up at some point. Um, but so the, it, I'm assuming that the one that would involve the least pain um, would be the this one, which is the cutting off of the head if it was done properly. And I'm getting most of my assumptions from Wolf Hall <laughs> and how they executed people in the 1500s by the sword. Rabbi Kash, doesn't does yeah. the Gemara itself, I remember just reading one recently, as to which which is the worst of the punishments. And that, right. that because of that's of, of issue and some dispute, but right. do you recall which one I thought? One is stoning or Srefa, I think. Yeah, Srefa. I think Srefa was the, supposedly the worst. Right. They went back and forth, I think, between those two. But um, yeah, and you could, but but the, there's a Gemara, I forgot who it was who had instructed the people to do the burning, like we see burning um, portrayed from the Middle Ages. Um, but then he was told he made a mistake and then he he uh, was like in retro, he, he was trying to, you know, to do tshuva, you know, like for the rest of his life for that mistake that he made. Because there, you, you could imagine, that that's a much longer, terrible way to die. Um, Rabbi, were these punishments yeah. ever instituted or were they just stated to act as a deterrent? Or were they actually well, instituted? There, there is a discussion where Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon said that if they were on the Sanhedrin when they carried it out, by the time of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon, the Sanhedrin did not carry out death penalties. Um, the it seems like um, the that they didn't carry out 
death penalties after around 50 years before the common era. Um, so that would mean like uh, that already by the time of the Mishnah and, and the teachings and events characterized in the Mishnah, you know, from those times on um, that they no longer had a death penalty you know, and the death penalty w wasn't carried out by by an official Jewish court. Um, I believe it, it was Herod who, it was under Herod, might have been earlier, but I believe it was under Herod that the Sanhedrin decided, uh, exiled itself because he he took away the power to, do death penalties from the Sanhedrin, I think it was Herod. And therefore uh, the Sanhedrin exiled themselves because they were no longer a fully um, uh, active body because they no longer had the power to do death penalties. So they, um, so they, they exiled themselves from, uh, from, uh, Beit Hamikdash, where they used to be. Um, I, I again, heard a yeah. I heard I heard a non-legal explanation of it is that uh, murder cases had proliferated to the point that they didn't want to be in the business of shedding Jewish blood. And it that was because Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Akiva, and uh, Rebbe Tarfon, who were later had said that if they were on the Sanhedrin, even when they did it, they would have ensured that there was never a death penalty. Um, but the argument against them was that they, um, that if they didn't carry out the death penalty, there would be more, the murder would be rampant. So it does seem like there was a, debate about the effectiveness of the death penalty during their time, but their time is um, already, you know, like 150 years after there never, there weren't any more death penalties. But for instance, again, it's hard to tell from Gemara's whether they're, when they give numbers for things, but for instance, they, there is a Gemara that Shimon ben Shetach, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, at one point during yeah. the reign of Alexander Janius Brianni, that he had a hundred, he had 80 witches hung um, in one day. Um, and so I don't know, you know, exactly what that means. And I don't know if the number 80 is an exact number, um, but it does seem like as late as that, which is in the second century before the common era, like it's, it's post Hanukkah. It's like, uh, I think it's around a hundred of the common era, uh, before the common era. So it, it, if you, again, some, some of these stories, it's hard to know how historic, you know, if they're trying to be historical, but it does seem like they, um, they were executing people. Again, it's hard to tell from that Gemara because how could they have done the deliberations required to hang that many people um, um, you know, in one day? <laughs> so it, it's, uh, I, I haven't, I, I must admit, I haven't, um, I never, even though I learned a lot of those, I learned all those Gemaras, I, I never did a thorough real investigation as, about the death penalty and how it was carried out and when it was carried out. I just, you know, as I was going through the Gemaras, you know, they would come up and we'd talk about them. So I don't, um, it's not a area specialty of mine. I don't know, um, in, you know, anything in depth, very much in depth about it. I do remember Moshe Shapiro did emphasize that even though 
the Sanhedrin wasn't there in order to carry out death penalties, there were death sentences that were carried out on people up to modern times for things like informing to to the enemy. So if if there was somebody who was putting Jewish lives at risk by informing to the enemy, um, there were even rabbis involved in making sure that these people were killed again up to modern times, certainly through the Holocaust. Um, that uh, there were there was permission to kill and sometimes Reb Moshe, Moshe Shapiro told us that his father remembers as a child in Lithuania um, the rub of their town standing in front of a well there was an informer who had been I guess thrown into the well and the rub of the town stood in front of the well and wouldn't let anybody come to that guy's aid until he drowned so that's not one of the four um, ways to kill somebody it wasn't a biblically um, mandated way of killing somebody but it was killing somebody and he said it was evidence of the fact and the, and, and the Rambam mentions this I, I, I don't remember where but I've, I've seen the Rambam inside where the Rambam mentions that even though the death penalty is no longer the official death penalty through the Sanhedrin or one of the one of those courts is no longer <clears throat> in use but uh, the great people of the generation have the authority to have somebody killed using a, a kind of emergency decree. Um, and there are stories in Responsa and in, in Jewish halachic, other Jewish halachic sources of, of that happening. Um, even up till modern times. So, yeah. But here's the strangulation. That is that he commanded us to strangle those who transgress certain commandments. And that is his maybe blessed saying, he shall surely be put to death. And behold, in the negative commandments, we will indicate those which require strangulation. And the regulation of those commandments have already been explained in Tractate Sanhedrin. In the Mishnah Torah, the Sanhedrin and penalties. I just want to look here if he if he describes um, well let we'll look at um, how he 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 describes uh, Skila the way I had mentioned it. Let's see if he describes. Yeah, he goes into some depth about All right, here's the burning one. Here, we might as well just do all of them inside. Uh, an idolater, now let's see here. He's, he talks about the stoning. So we'll look at them. How is the mitzvah of stoning carried out? Four cubits from the place of execution. We remove the clothes of the person to be stoned. We do, however, cover a sexual organ in front. A woman is not executed naked. She's allowed to wear one cloak. The place of execution was two stories high. The converse, convicted person ascends there with his hands tied together with his witnesses. One of the witnesses pushes him at his loins from behind. He falls over, landing on his heart on the ground. If he dies because of this, they have fulfilled the obligation as it states, or he will be cast down or stoned. Creating an equation between a person who has a stone fall upon him with one who falls on the earth. If he does not die after the fall, the witnesses pick up a stone that is so large it requires two people to carry it. The second witness lets go and the first casts the stone on the convicted person's heart. If he dies because of this, they have fulfilled the obligation. If not, he should be stoned by the entire Jewish people. As Deuteronomy states, the hand of the witnesses shall be raised up against him first to execute him and the hand of the entire Jewish nation afterwards. 
and idolaters should be stoned at the gateway to the place where he performed the transgression. If the majority of the population of the city are Gentiles, he should be stoned at the entrance to the court. This concept has been conveyed by the oral tradition. The term to your gate states that an idolater should be executed refers to the gate where he performed the transgression and not the gate where he was sentenced. The mitzvah of executing a person by burning is performed as follows. The convicted person is placed in, they say fertilizer in Hebrew, it is dung. They are placed in, well, dung. <clears throat> Until his knees, a firm cloth is placed within a soft cloth and they're wound around his necks. Two witnesses are producing on either side and either pull, each pull the cloth towards himself until the convicted open his mouth. Tin, lead, and the like are melted down and then poured into his mouth. The molten metal descends and burns his innards. The mitzvah decapitation is performed as follows. We cut off his head with a sword as the kings do. The mitzvah of executing a person by strangulation is performed as follows. The convicted is placed in dung until his knees. A firm cloth is placed within a soft cloth that round around his neck. Each of the two witnesses pull the cloth toward him until the convic convicted expires. So this is not classic hanging. This is strangling. Uh, it is a positive commandment to hang a blasphemer and an idolater after they've been executed. A person who is hung is cursing God. This refers to the blasphemer. With regard to the idolater, it states he blasphemes God. A man is hung, but a woman is not hung, as implied, when a man has sinned and condemned to die. After he is executed, shall hang him. How is the mitzvah of hanging carried out? After the convict is stoned, a beam is implanted in the ground with a rafter protruding from it. The two hands of the corpse are intercrossed, and he is hung close to sunset. He is released immediately. If not, a negative commandment is transgressed. Do not let the corpse tarry overnight on the beam. So it seems like he's not hung by around the neck. He's hung by his hands. He's dead at this point. But it seems like they, hunt, they hang him from his hands, not from around the neck. <clears throat> um, it is a positive mitzvah to bury the persons executed by the court on the day of their execution. For you shall surely bury him on that day. Not only executed by the court, but anyone who leaves a deceased overnight without burying him transgresses a negative commandment. If, however, a burial is delayed overnight to honor the deceased, to bring a coffin or shrouds, this is not a transgression. Um, and by the way, this is like the discussion of our <laughs> of burial. This is where the Torah uh, talks about the. This is how it's understood, and as as the Rambam's expressing it, that uh, that we must be buried as opposed to. Um, disposing of the body in another way um, because if this is how you treat uh, a person who was executed uh, how much more so do you have to do this for a, a person who lived a life of honor they, they need to be buried in the ground uh, it's not what you would expect especially because Jewish burial was, um, at least during Roman times, um, it was pointed out as an exception to the way people are dealt with after. I don't know what Romans did after people died, but Beryl Wine points this out that in Roman literature, you see them uh, point this out as uniquely Jewish, the custom to bury people in the ground. Um, nowadays, uh, it was taken for granted that Jews would bury people in the ground. Up until a few decades ago, it was extremely rare for Jews to choose cremation or some other way of disposing of the body. I think I saw um, um, that there were, 
it was data from not long ago, I don't know, just a few decades ago that only 5% of Jews uh, chose cremation. But now the numbers are well over 30% of Jews um, choose cremation. And so there's a movement that has developed um, to try to inform Jews uh, about the need to bury the dead and not be cremated. And um, part of that includes some misunderstandings about burial. There, there, there is an assumption that you have no option but to spend lots of money on burial. That is often the case that burial is expensive, but um, there are, every, every community has uh, funds to make sure that every Jew gets buried. The Federation, I think in um, almost every state in the United States um, offers this for every Jew that there, there can be burial. I attended one burial that was a kind of pauper's burial that was funded by the Jewish community. Um, and that, you know, that it was known that it was funded by the community. I'm certain there's others where people are being helped because it is expensive, but it's absolutely essential that people be buried. Here you see this notion of not being left overnight. Um, uh, let's see here. On the day of, of the, uh, not only those executed by the court, but anyone who leaves the deceased overnight without burying him transgresses a negative commandment. How, if, however, a burial is delayed overnight to honor the deceased. So that's usually the explanation that people want. Um, it is honor to the deceased to have um, a larger attendance at their burial. Uh, so that's why uh, you're allowed to wait a day or two before the person is buried. Um, but otherwise, you're not supposed to wait. So, for instance, in Jerusalem, the Hever Kedisha will not allow you to wait. So I've attended uh, burials at night in Jerusalem um, it's very uncommon to attend one at night in America. I, although I heard, I did hear of a, a friend who, a, a rabbi from Baltimore, who ends up being buried in Milwaukee, that his his burial was at night. Um, but the but, my, but it's it's very rare to see that. But in Jerusalem, they they won't let you wait. Um, you know, more than a couple hours to gather people for the for the burial. There was an exception that was made for Moshe Feinstein. Um, I think Moshe Feinstein died in the eighties, and I was at his funeral and burial, um, but there was a huge argument with the Heber Kedisha in Jerusalem because they didn't want to wait to the next day after his body was flown in. But there were all these people who were arguing that it would be a massive funeral if you wait. And if you don't wait, it's not going to be. And therefore, for the honor of him and the honor of Torah, you need to delay it. And they didn't want to delay it. I, I think what I heard is Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach eventually told them they have to wait. And then it was a massive funeral. It was a few hundred thousand people that were at his funeral. Um, but anyway, so that, um, this is one of the source texts for the discussion about Jewish burial in the ground. Rabbi, uh, um, yeah. I have a question about that. Um, before the question, I believe, I don't know all over the Roman Empire, but I believe in Rome, it was cremation. You talk about funeral pyres and things. Like, but um, okay. if a Jewish cemetery has, since they do have a place to place ashes of someone who's, you know, cremated, is that kosher? Is that 
allowed? I guess it is because I was just at one. <laughs> I don't know if, if it's allowed. I remember there was a, a young man uh, who was a friend of our family who worked at Shalom. Mm -hmm. And Shalom had uh, urns with ashes in it. He, I, he had urns with ashes in his office or something where he worked there. And his question was, is he allowed to, to be in the room there? What, is, is there an issue of the sacred? He wasn't a coin, but it was mainly, is it a, a degradation of the sacred, you know, some kind of uh, sanctity? Um, for him to be working in an office like that or eating his lunch there. I, I don't remember what the answer was he, that he was given. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a, if, if, a, if, if, if a place already does it, um, yeah, I mean, I know Jews are still buried there. I will say there are rabbinic figures who consider Shalom not to be a choice place to be buried, but that has to do with the fact that they don't allow you to put up a matseva. There is a marker on your grave, um, but they don't allow you to put a monument up. And so there are some rabbinic figures who suggest that if you have a choice, you should be buried somewhere that lets you put up a marker. Hmm. Um, but certainly I've gone to, you know, many funerals there and, um, and the, they are halakhically buried, but it's, right. it is, it well, is at Shalom, a they very kind of um, let the different, I don't know what you'd say this, but the people who are buried in a vault, the, the, where the vault is, is kind of lower underground. So you're actually in the ground, but not in the ground, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, in, in, in Jerusalem, they have. They have, it's not a vault per se, but it's very similar to a vault. Because there, there's a cemetery, um, it's called Har HaManuchos, which is technically in Jerusalem near the Harnof neighborhood. And it was a, it's a very desired place um, for people to be buried. And a lot of, like Moshe Feinstein's buried there, a lot of uh, very important rabbinic figures are buried there. And um, and so, uh, but what they've done is they now bury them. You you can take an you take an elevator and go down. But I think the way it is, it's still buried. What they've done is they've dug out the ground so that technically you're still buried in the ground. Um, but it's like sideways so that you're standing and looking at the ground in front of you instead of the ground being underneath you. Hmm. I actually have not witnessed it. I've heard people have witnessed it and they said it's very weird. Also, um, because they have such, they didn't have a lot of space there. I was at a, a funeral where I witnessed them. They couldn't lay the body completely out they sort of sit the body in the, they bend the legs and sit the body. So because uh, of lack of space. And so obviously there's different options. I mean, originally people were buried in caves. And when I say originally going back to the patriarchs, people were buried in caves. And uh, so, but the understanding is that in the cave itself, the body was still buried in ground. They weren't just laid out in the cave. Although I've heard tour guides say that when you had a family, if you had a family crypt, um, so, you know, family cave. So the way, way it would work, again, this is from tour guides. I don't know what, you know what to say about it. But they said that what it would happen is the body would be buried in the ground. And then when it got to be a skeleton, they would take out the skeleton and the bones would be placed on shelves inside the cave so that there was room to, mar to bury bodies in the, in, the, in the ground of the cave. 
I don't know what to say about that other than that's what I was told by tour guides. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you see those places that have thousands of skulls. Just Right. Right. But they typically aren't Jewish. You know, right. The, yeah. Right. So, yeah. but, uh, but they, they were claiming they found, they have found lots of those with shelves with bones on them. And they believe that's what they were doing that these were Jewish cave, you know, burial caves, but mm -hmm. they, but that the, so they think what they did was they buried them in the ground till they were just skeleton. Then they put the skeleton, the bones on the shelves afterwards. Hmm. I don't know if that would be logically acceptable. Typically um, when you hear discussions about moving a dead body, moving any part of the dead body is considered a disgrace unless there is some reason of honor that trumps it. So if there's more honor involved, they allow you to move the body. So let's say the body was during the war, the body's buried in a Gentile cemetery and you know where the grave is and now it could be buried in a Jewish cemetery. That's considered one of the reasons you can move a body. And by then it might just be a skeleton or whatever, but so, but it makes it sound like any movement of the body for other reasons would, would be wrong, but so I don't know. I don't know. What about to be buried with family? Because we had an aunt who was moved to be where her husband was buried. Right. These are like case by case bases. Uh, there's this rabbi in Queens, Rabbi Zone, who's considered like the authority on these halachic issues. And I was involved with a case where there was a family in Northbrook who had an, uh, I think it was an aunt who was buried in a cemetery in New York and they wanted to move her to a family cemetery in California. And it was permitted, but there could be a lot more to these stories. Like it's a case by case basis, but that is part of, that was definitely part of the exception that was made, but you have to demonstrate that somehow it would be the honor of the person if they were still alive, it would be their honor to move. And that's why you're moving them. You're moving them for honor. You're not moving them for convenience or things like that. You're moving them for honor. Um, yeah. Okie dokie. May we all uh, um, see not just the coming of Mashiach, but the resurrection of the dead. And may yeah. death <laughs> itself Swallowed up. Be like a mother for that song. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. Yes, you. That's, Rabbi, the, See you in the um, morning. The, what I was yeah. talking about before was Neva Dekalim, which was originally a settlement in, in the Sinai, was moved to Gaza and then taken out of Gaza. And there was a yeshiva connected with that settlement, the Gush uh -huh. Yeah. And then yeah. now there it's moved. It's somewhere between Ashkelon and someplace else but there's a fundraiser who co he comes here from there every year and he's called uh -huh. this morning so that's what i okay oh, yeah got it got and it. and those boys ser do serve in the army so right uh, yeah but, all right thank you right. rabbi tomorrow morning yeah yeah tomorrow morning we're good good bye-bye right. you all guys bye. Bye.